Good evening, everyone. My name is Erin Raftery Ryan. I'm the Executive Director of NAMI Westside Los Angeles. I'd like to welcome you this evening. Uh, let's admit Adrian. Adrian, um, admit you and welcome you to this evening's November Janice Black Warner Speaker Series. Um, we have a lovely speaker joining us this evening with a wonderful presentation. Um, I would first like to introduce um, a very familiar face and trailblazer for our organization, which is our president emeritus, Sharon Dunis, who is now actually um, also our chief, um, our mental health clinician advocate. Um, see that our um, angel donor and advisory council member is also joining us, Janice Black Warner. I'd like to thank her for making these presentations possible. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over the meeting to Sharon and she will introduce our speaker this evening. Okay, and we'll have a couple of announcements towards the end of the meeting as well. So please stick around for some updates uh, about Nami Westside LA. Thank you so, so much, Erin. My my name is Sharon Dunas. I've been the president off and on for 25 years of NAMI Westside Los Angeles. And I'm now functioning as a clinician, a mental health clinician for the organization and for anybody who calls me. So I want to introduce Dr. Uh, Eric Wechsler to you. He is a board certified physician and scientist who specializes in the diagnosis and pharmacological management of psychiatric illnesses. Guided by the principles of evidence-based medicine, which our, cla our NAMI class is also um, uh, guided by that, he treats a broad range of psychiatric disorders, including those uh, listed below, and I'll just read them through you very Bipolar affective disorder, schizophrenia, unipolar major depression, uh, impulse control disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, uh, opiate addiction, neuropsychiatry, personalized medicine, and genomics coming from genes. Uh, so he has some essential clinical experiencing, experience managing complex neuropsychiatric syndromes, particularly those in individuals with a coexisting neurological disease. Related to his clinical expertise, he's also published uh, several articles on developmental neuropsychology, neuropharmacology, and neurogenetics. He's currently accepting new pa patients seeking evaluation and treatment or second opinions, as well as referrals for forensic consult consultation. So I give you our esteemed colleague, primarily from UCLA, Dr. Eric Wexler. Thank and you. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to be talking tonight a little bit about the treatment of psychosis. Um, I will take a moment here to just be able to share my screen. Um, and if you could bear with me for a second. And, but in that introduction, you heard that I, I do have a PhD in pharmacology and used to do research in the field. You will not hear a lot about medication tonight. I put one slide in just to because what I'm going to really talk about tonight are the psychosocial treatments of schizophrenia and psychosis, because it is the more valuable and quite frankly, often neglected component of treatment that actually makes a difference between saving someone's life and not. And so let me just um, last chair, get rid of the little presenter things. Um, does everyone just see a picture of the ocean now? Yes. Okay. So I yeah, used to be at UCLA. I've opened up, uh, was the medical director of another treatment program for a few years. And more recently, I've opened up a specialty care program for people with psychosis, both chronic and uh, new onset. And the, here, I'll just uh, admit those people. Um, Slide here, one thing I, 
just actually maybe a show of hands. Who here sees a fish in, in the clouds? Yeah, okay, good, good. Because that, the reason why you see that fish partially explains why people develop psychosis in the first place and why some people don't. But the take home will be, there is a smaller difference between what we consider to be psychotic thought and normal thought. And it's that very slight change that can make such a huge difference in people's lives. And so the, you saw a cloud and your brain has seen fish, you saw the water and the context of it drove you to look back and impose some order on the randomness. It's just a cloud. There's no goldfish flying in the, in, and you know that. But your brain tries to make sense of the world. And so I just wanna lead people through a little bit how the brain does that. And so here are two sentences. The first one, read it for yourselves for a moment, but everyone sees Jack and Jill went up the hill, right? Yeah. Next sentence, the last event was canceled. But if you look at the ones that are underlined, you'll see that the W in one place is an EV in another, ambiguity. But your brain still was able to understand the difference based on the probabilities your brain has determined by the language, because you speak the language fluently, presuming you do. And you were able to fill it in and by use the context to derive meaning. That's a natural way the brain works. If that process begins to fail in even a subtle way, things get confused. And from confusion, other things happen. Um, the next thing is, uh, is share computer sound. Uh, I need to, there's a sound bite on the next. So I'm gonna just play something for you. I can't really, in, in a lecture hall, I'd be able to ask you, but most people don't, people hear some garbled sounds. Some people may hear words. Does anyone, did anyone hear words or most people just hear garbled sounds? Okay, I'm not gonna ask, I'm not gonna put you on the spot, but just try and remember what it is you think you heard. Now I'm gonna play a different thing for you. She cut with her knife, she cut with her knife, she cut with her knife, she cut with her knife. And now the first one again. She cut with her knife. Ah, she... shush. Okay, there we go. Whatever you thought you heard before, you probably heard she cut with a knife the, the second time when I... Now, what I'll tell you is that the first sounds were actually just random sounds. They actually were not a person. They're completely synthesized. The reason why the second time you kind of heard was because your brain was primed by, by being told. You think you were being told. Your brain heard something else. It matched, sim it was similar enough, it matches. And if you hear it enough time, you'll never be able to unhear it. So just to go on to the next, to another one. It also works, and here's just another sound. But now, without the priming of the sound, but just by the sound. Oh, shush. Yeah. So. The kettle boiled quickly. The kettle boiled quickly. The kettle boiled quickly. Most people, not everyone, but most people after hearing it once or twice, the kettle boiled quickly, they will then hear, every time they hear that, for all, they will hear the kettle boiled quickly. And that has a fancy name called a pareidolia, but what it is, is a very normal brain trying to use incomplete information to fill in. But what it did was it filled in what it thinks made sense to a bunch of nonsense. It created meaning from randomness. It created purpose from something that didn't have it. Now, in some cases, oh, 
we're all used to the same things happen with visual stuff. Okay, here are some of my favorite ones. We all see things just like we saw the fish in the clouds. You know, you might see here, let me just get the little pointer going. You know, people see an angry face in the handbag, a funny face in the church, a pouty face in the apples, um, an angry face in the tree. But these are, of course, not put there. These are just randomness. Um, but what, but psychosis is really, in its most fundamental level, the failure of your brain to make sense of the world using processes it usually has. And so what happens when the whimsical, like the whimsical pictures in the first slide, now start to take on more ominous, look a little more ominous? Imagine you're in a situation where everything around you, all of a sudden, no matter how random it is, every shape takes on a meaning. It has intention, bad intentions. That would be very disconcerting to any of us and, then, and inescapable for people with the disorders I'll be talking about. And so the descent into psychosis, the reason why it's missed so easily is because it doesn't just happen like that. It evolves, it's a slow process because the normal brain mechanisms are just a little bit off. Not a lot, just a little bit off. It's just a little bit of the world trying to make sense. So let's try it in something a little bit, maybe a little more real life. I'm not sure you can really see. There's a picture, of, what you have here is a picture of a woman with a neutral face. And now, She's neither happy nor sad, but say someone is having a difficulty with some of those abilities to understand things. If anyone here in the audience has a child who has autism, you will recognize what I'm talking about as what's called a lack of theory of mind or, or a lack of emotional ability to appreciate emotional expression. Effective blindness sometimes it's referred to but it's a common symptom of autism. And people with psychosis have autism. A hundred years ago, autism was one of the defining, something like autism was a defining feature. It's because the people lacked social cognition. They had very serious impairment of social cognition. And so the way this plays out is the person, a little too small, and I apologize for that, but I'll read it to you. The person sees the neutral face, can't really perceive the meaning of the face, thinks the coworker's angry, assumes using a mental filter that they're angry at them, and then they confront the coworker. The normal response is the coworker denies it, and they say, oh, I just must be overthinking things. I'm having a bad day, I'll leave it alone. But someone with deficits in social cognition or deficits in perception of context will jump to a conclusion and not be able to use new information to change that opinion. And those go by names, those biases, those cognitive biases go by names like jumping to conclusions or a bias against disconformatory evidence, a big mouthful, I know, but basically just means they can't change their mind. And so what they do is they confront the coworker, they think the coworker is angry, they see the face that they saw yesterday and they conclude is angry. This just proves to them even more the coworker is angry at them. They ask the coworker, coworker says, still, I'm not angry at you, what's your problem? Now they're sure the person's lying to them. And now we set up a loop. So they get angry at the coworker now and they confront the coworker about the lying and the anger and then it plays out again. And so what will happen is two things. One, the coworker will become angry at them and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, it's a driven one. And it leads even more credence. so it, you get a breakdown of that social tie at work. It makes, maybe they get fired because they're getting in people's face. It leads to impaired employment, impaired independence in that regard. But also they start to think of, okay, who else is lying? Because they start to generalize. Because if you cannot use evidence to change an opinion, the rational reasoning is not going to get you out of a problem. It, you're only going to keep, you get into a feedback loop where you keep using the same flawed reasoning to simply confirm your pre-held beliefs that you jumped to in the first place. And so at first you saw 
what looked like maybe a fish, but then you're like, no, I see it's, it's fuzzy. It's, it's a, an ocean. It's not really a fish. It's just a cloud. But if you don't have that ability to reject with new evidence, that first conclusion you jump to, that's how you'd have a, that's a delusion. It's, that's how you develop a fixed false belief, the definition of a delusion. So delusions evolve. They have time, they evolve. But the fact that they evolve also is why we have time to intervene. And we have the ability with the right types of therapy that I'll talk about a little bit later to actually make a difference. Medications help, but medications are obviously not the whole thing. So the, the next part of what I wanna do is I, it's remiss of me to ever go through a talk and not explain why people need to be treated. And I mean, really, really need to be treated. Um, the, I think many people here who have had loved ones, shared experience in this regard, know what some of the signs were when looking back in uh, time, you know, what happened first, the kids' grades dropped, maybe they stopped taking a shower, maybe they started talking about some strange stuff, um, maybe they seemed down or they sounded a little odd in the way they're describing, but that was what's called the, the prodrome for psychosis. They're not psychotic, but they're starting to evolve what we call positive and negative symptoms. And positive symptoms are very simply things that are there that shouldn't be. Negative symptoms are things that should be there that aren't. You should take care of yourself. You should talk to people. You should enjoy yourself. You shouldn't think that there are conspiracies of people out to get you. Uh, politics aside, um, but you shouldn't think those things, and because they get in the way. And so, ultimately, what's really happening during that prodrome is you're starting to develop a cluster of symptoms. There is a set of neurocognitive deficits, and by neurocognitive, I mean what we generally consider to be normal brain functioning, things like memory, attention, verbal reasoning, planning, risk assessment, other executive function tasks. Negative sim the positive symptoms I described, those are like fixed false beliefs or hallucinations. Um, the negative symptoms are quite broad, but those fall into the, those that, are lack of energy and lack of interest. So they're unmotivated, they're lot less social interest, they're unable to enjoy stuff, that's anhedonia, they're unable to care for themselves, that's abulia. They have two very diametrically opposed views on whether to do something or interest and that's ambivalence. They lack emotional expression, flat affect. They are unable to express their emotions verbally or non-verbally with facial expressions or other non-verbal communication. And they don't wanna talk as much, that's elogia. But they're also at the same time experiencing this social cognition, what's called social cognition. They're, as I described before, they're less and less able to understand the emotional content of speech or what people faces, what we get from people's faces. They're unable to tap into their own emotional state. They're unable to infer what other people are thinking or meaning by what they're saying. That's called theory of mind or mentalizing. And that makes it very hard to have a social interaction in a normal group because you don't, we all need to understand our audience in order to understand whether we're saying the right thing, not saying the right thing. Are we in their face? Are we annoying them? Are we making them happy? Are we giving them what they want in this communication? But you can't do that if you can't know if you're flying blind. And a little bit like giving a um, PowerPoint presentation when you can't see any of the people in the audience. Um, and ultimately this causes social problems. There's a downward social spiral. People get more anxious and depressed. And I'll talk more about, but that's that's the that's the downward spiral. So here's probably maybe the most important slide on one of the most important slides. And the idea is that some people, when they first this first happens, people get develop these symptoms, and some small segment of the population recovers, treatment or not. Most people think that they're among those people, the ones who everything 
gets better. But the truth is most people aren't. And what happens is the symptoms get really bad and then they get better. That's sometimes called a honeymoon period. And it's the most dangerous time because what this is, is 100% proof to the affected individuals, but also the, the trying to be positive family members who say, well, they're almost all better. Uh, maybe they need to, have, maybe they'll do a little this, a little that. It's not a big deal if they get treated, not treated. They don't see the imperative in it because they think that they're not up here. They think they're down here and it's on the men. And everyone thinks that, but the statistics are most people are up here, are, are in the place where they are going to get worse. It's going to come back. And more importantly, when it does, every time it does, it causes long-term harm. And so a lot of people may have seen this picture before, but this is taken from uh, a 10-year study on people. The, the brain scans are pretty self-explanatory, healthy control, a patient who took their medication was in treatment, and someone who didn't. More... You can see more atrophy, larger ventricles. That means an atrophy in the part of the, the inner part of the brain that's actually where most of the antipsychotics work. If you wanted, if you're more of a graph kind of man or woman, the people who had uh, good outcomes, if you look at brain volume versus how long you versus the amount of time between the scans, which is this is a measure of loss, what you find is People who were healthy controls and people who had good clinical outcomes didn't lose a lot of brain. Other people lost a lot of brain. And this is just another way of describing exactly the same thing. It looks at brain volume over time for people who um, had relapsing schizophrenia versus not. The answer is you want to be treated. You don't want to look on the bright side and have a Pollyannish view because once you lose that momentum for treatment, you may not be able to get it back. It, 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 you may not have the same level of recovery. And, but don't want to be a total downer here. The flip side is what happens if you do get treated? And I say that this, at least the, this shows that this figure shows brain volume gets better, but there have been studies of where they've looked at functionality, both on positive symptoms, negative symptoms, and overall functioning for people for 20 years who've been treated. And here is a study where they looked at people over 20 years and they broke them down based on whether they got treated within the first month or two or whether they waited two years to get treated. So two years before they went into consistent treatment, people who were treated within the first couple of months. This scale is called the PANS. Total score, it measures overall psychotic symptomatology, symptoms severity. Um, the range goes from 30 to a little over 200. The people who were treated quickly were almost symptom-free. They had a, if you notice, it says a score of 40, which is just a little bit above baseline. The people who had delayed treatment, they got better but not nearly as better on a total symptom severity standpoint scale. So faster treatment yields better results even 20 years down the road. And if you wanna look at a more functional set of measures, one is called the GAF, which is a, called the Global Assessment of Functioning. Uh, not really used as much anymore, but it looks at sim social functioning, occupational functioning, and um, so overall symptom severity. And again, the people who had delayed treatment far, fair, worse, fair, far worse. Um, on this scale, a 70 is independent. A 50 to 60 is probably needs, a, probably needs help. And, and these, and remember these are means. But also the quality, but what's even, but the biggest difference maybe reflected is the overall quality of life is much worse. And the, now this is mostly medication only treatment, but it's a, it's a, there's not a lot of controls on this, but the take home message is people who have treatment delayed do worse 
And so if nothing else, if you remember nothing else from this talk, it's tell all your friends that the treatment needs to start early if any, do whatever you can to get it done early. Um, and so most people think treatment is medication. You heard I had a PhD in pharmacology. I used to be a professor in UCLA, did research in this. But you know what? Medication is never is necessary, but it's never enough. Um, the fact that we've had 50 years to prove it. Thorazine came out in the 1950s. Clozapine came out in the 70s. They closed all the state hospitals because they thought that if positive symptoms went away, which is what the medications are very good at, everyone would get better, have jobs, lives, families, wrong. It's, it was a failed experiment because whether you think the government's out to get you or whether you hear voices is not why you don't have a job. There are people who, who work in Starbucks and have people screaming all around them and have voices in their head. There are other people's voices, but they have distraction and they're able to work. There are people who are very paranoid and they're in government and they seem to be just fine as being congressmen and senators these days, despite having tremendous conspiracy theories. They just know when to talk about them and when not to talk about them. But if you can't hold a conversation and you can't navigate social situations, you can't have a job, you can't be in school, and you can't get along well with people, and you need even more support. You won't have support because there's no one there for you. So if you want to build a life, a life worth living at least, you need to do something about some of those things that the medication doesn't help too much for. Like I said, I'll give you one slide on medications. Uh, if anyone has, by the way, if anyone does have medication questions later, I'll, I'll address those. Um, the gold standard, there's patients fall into two categories, compliant and non-compliant largely. If they're non-compliant, the, the data are unbelievably overwhelming that if you get someone on a long acting injectable medication, they fare so much better. They're essentially nowadays, most, most of the time people end up on one of two drugs, haloperidone or aripiprazole. Um, the brand names are listed on the slide there. Uh, but they used to only be monthly, but now in Vega, haloperidone now has one that can be taken every six months, which is a boon to uh, uh, getting your insurance to cover it is a different story. But, but at least in theory, they're available. You don't have to get the person you don't have to fight with them very many times to obtain compliance. If they are compliant with medication, really the best data are for Vralar. Um, clozapine is still the gold standard, although it has a lot of side effects. Again, I'll, I'm gonna stay medication short tonight if I'll answer any questions about that later. Um, people fail clozapine, you can add things to it. On the horizon, I just want to add this in because probably in calendar year 2023, there's a, there's a fair chance, I'm holding my, crossing my fingers if people can see that, um, that there are two new drugs will come on the market. Um, there are two drugs that have done very, very well in clinical trials. Um, one will be marketed, the first one um, being marketed by, uh, we've been marketed by Synovian, and the other one is from Karuna. Um, Neither of them work by the mechanism of action that every other antipsychotic does. They have very good side effect profiles and they will, and they seem to work quite well and they should not have the risk of long-term neurological problems like tardivis tunisia. So I'm crossing my fingers. The data has been really good. They've had enough trials. They have new drug applications and hopefully they'll get approved this year. Um, again, I can show you the data on, I can show you the data from those trials at the end if someone really is interested. But what we're going to talk about is the psychosocial pro approach to, to this. And so the idea is the government funded a long time ago the concept of a multimodal specialized care for psychosis. The idea being that you can't mix different kinds of patients together. You want to have as homogeneous a group as possible. And you want to treat not just one aspect of their problems, but everything. The idea being based on this thing called the stress vulnerability model, which is a lot of things lead to dysfunction, which means you need to hit at multiple places to achieve recovery of function. And so 
the idea was to build resiliency and recovery, not just reduce symptom severity, although that does happen, but try to drive people to engage in their own treatment and then engage in broader lives. And the, there were several flavors implemented, but there've been many others. The first two were On Track New York and in New York um, and Navigate um, developed by uh, a bunch of people from UCLA and, and Kim User from who's out east, but obviously a bit but they're, both of them make their materials readily available. And they include the Navigate, I'll just use as the exemplar here. And that is family education, family therapy, supported education and employment, because that's really a main goal, social skills training, and what's called individual resiliency training. And that's sort of the umbrella term for psychotherapy and relapse prevention and any trauma processing that required and anything else that's necessary for someone to be able to resist the effects of their brain not functioning properly. And the question is, does it work? Yes, again, by two measures. If you look at people who have at just one year, um, you'll notice hospitalizations plummet the number of people engaging in either education or employment went up, their overall social functioning goes up and their symptom severity improves. This is essentially the gap that you saw before, gap scale you saw before. And if you combine modes of treatment together, in this case, looking at adding cognitive training, because I said there are cognitive deficits, add cognitive training to the employment, it works even better still. So validation that this, multi, that this coordinated multi, um, uh, here, I'll skip that one. Um, model is actually effective. So as I said in the beginning, I've opened a, a program that is not politically affiliated and not funded by the county. So it affords a lot of flexibilities. And so what I've done is I've opened a program to combine the best parts of on track and the Navigate program um, for those of you familiar with the aftercare program at UCLA, um, it incorporates everything that Joe Ventura would want in a program, but can't, we have. And I know that because he came to visit the other day. And so there are things that can't be implemented in the aftercare program, for those who don't know, is a research-based program that's been going on, started by Keith Lupulain about, God, maybe 30 plus years ago, um, that does implement the coordinated care model, but it's still research-based and it's very limited in how many people can get in. Um, and people have to fit, be slotted into a research protocol in order to participate. Um, so I've taken my experience on treating patients in the last treatment center that I ran, to really refine it. And so the, what we've implemented is uh, the best of all worlds, I believe. And the first thing, and we have a slightly different approach, although the not much different. The first thing is that, is I actually think an emphasis that's missed is on agency, is restoring agency and self-expression. It's anyone here who's had a family member who's been hospitalized, will recognize that a common story. The person maybe wanted help, maybe they didn't, they got taken to the hospital. If you're on the west side, you got taken to UCLA. UCLA had no beds. They gave them some shots. They strapped them to a gurney. They put them on a hold. They put them in an ambulance. They put him or her, sent them over to the Lama or Los Encinas. They were kept for a few weeks, you know, clearly against their will. It wouldn't take much for us to, to get into their minds and say, if I'd been in prison for two, three weeks, I would feel a lack of agency, a lack of control of my life. And it is impossible to get better, to recover. It is impossible to engage in treatment constructively if you don't believe that it will help. 
And if you don't believe your life, you have control of your life. You also can identify the goals of that life if you can't express yourself. And so the very first thing we do is really focus on restoring agency and self-expression and in order to help people actually acquire that life worth living. We also do an assessment of not a standard neuropsych assessment, but a general functional assessment for real life skills, risk-taking behavior, executive function, and that kind of stuff. And then develop a lifestyle plan, um, some sort of plan. And, and how we do it is through a set of coordinated programs, very much like in some of these more formal programs with a few extra additions. Um, social skills training is there, of course. We, like On Track New York, we include a cognitive health. So we do both cognitive remediation, which the aftercare program has demonstrated is quite effective. We add cognitive remediation, meaning exercises to help people actually think better. And then we implement a more didactic, what's called cognitive, compensatory cognitive training, uh, which was developed at the VA. Um, and plus places for socialization. And um, here, let me just go forward. Uh, actually here, sorry, whoops, whoops, there we go. Um, we try to be flexible about it. Um, the goal is to get people into an intensive program. However, someone who's just been in the hospital against their will is usually quite loath to go jump into an IOP program or someone who's been in residential for three months is also loath to engage in, in in such intensive treatment. And so we also offer what I would call a transition program or one day a week, but, but, the, but that's really to get them engaged and then ultimately get them involved on a, um, what I call full-time basis, but full-time really means um, three days a week. Uh, more than that gets a little overwhelming for people. Um, we have a slightly broader uh, intake profile. We will take people who have both first episode and chronic psychosis, and we'll also take people in the high risk prodrome. So people who aren't psychotic yet, but who through ways, of, things I can explain later, um, qualify as a high risk of developing psychosis in the next year. Um, I can talk more about the specifics we have, but, but what I would say is each of the things we do has been specifically chosen because it is some technique that has been proven through numerous clinical trials to be effective in this specific population. It's not like most treatment programs where you go and there's people with every diagnosis. It's like, imagine taking a class where half the people only speak Spanish, half speak English. Which language do you give it in, Spanish or English? If you only could pick one half the people are gonna miss it. You can't, that was the idea of the CSC programs was you have to have the, the homogeneous population so you can target both the method of delivery, the message itself and how you deliver it specifically to the population experiencing psychosis. The things in red on this, some of the, I've mentioned a bunch of them um, and I'll speak a little bit more about them in the last uh, five minutes. Um, the things in red are things that are relatively unique for us. So metacognitive training, I'll describe in a moment, um, is a, I believe we're still the only people actually around to do it. Um, um, but it's gotten a lot of press because it is in recent large scale trials, uh, mostly done in Europe. Uh, it was even better than cognitive behavioral therapy for reducing not right away, but in, in a six month walk and later reducing positive symptoms. And what it is in very brief, cognitive therapy for those, most people know already, but cognitive behavioral therapy, the idea is you have a thought, you have another thought that's a little distorted. Ultimately, there's a train of thoughts. It leads to an emotional response that you don't like and a behavior that's probably not good for you. But a delusion is where you have fixed thoughts, but they're fixed. And so, in cognitive behavioral therapy for psychosis, what you do is you look a little further down in that thought train, you try to change those thoughts, and you don't get the emotional response. But you still have the innate inclination to jump to conclusions or not discount evidence or to discount evidence. 
Metacognitive training takes the entire emotion, takes totally neutral topics and only focuses on training you to think in a different way. It doesn't try changing the specific thoughts. It changes the way you think so that when those other distorted thoughts, whatever the topic is later comes down, you won't jump to conclusions. So it like will train you to not jump to conclusions. And that way you, avo you avoid a lot of the resistance and a lot of just incapacity to change those basic thoughts that makes cognitive therapy not as effective sometimes. Social cognition interaction training is uh, very similar to some of the autism approaches for autism where uh, you try and teach people to recognize social cues or social uh, content or at least how to get around it if they can. Um, in the last three, four minutes, um, I was asked to keep this to 40 minutes, so I will endeavor to do so. Um, we, we have a nice place and we have a very broad range. We try to reach, we attack every place in the, de in the model of where there are problems we try to remediate everything and that which we can't remediate, we try to compensate for and we have a plan for. The, I'll just go through just a couple of them. The resiliency training, which is sort of broad, we attack it. We have the social skills to teach you, which includes how to have a conversation, how to interact, how to go get lunch, how to, so one of the first things like say when people start, they, can they get their lunch? Maybe not. It's like, so first be able to order lunch. Go pick it up. Practical skills, health maintenance. We we have physical fitness three days a week. Um, the idea being two days a week now. Um, but we teach the stress tolerance, and then we also have places where people can we interact. We have a separate place where people can learn to use practice those skills. So the idea is to leverage what abilities people have in order to compensate for what they don't and to learn new skills. The cognitive health, much of it is computer-based and we have, like I said, both remediation, compensation, and then we also do the closely allied social cognition training, which is another form of remediation. I won't dwell on it since I already mentioned it. Um, Family therapy. Okay, one way that we're different a little bit, and I think it's very important to bring out, obviously families are most important. That's why you're all here, right? You're the primary support, primary caregivers, and you have their best interests at heart. But maybe in the beginning of this journey, you, didn't, you don't know a lot, you don't know what you need to know, you don't even know what you don't know, and you certainly don't know how to deal, most people don't know how to deal with a person who's sick. Or, or thinking in a way that doesn't make sense. And so what we do, actually, let me stop saying, what, similarly, the person who would be the client also is struggling to navigate those same family dynamics. And so our family program really is divided into two parts. Individual family systems where we have groups and one-on-one -on -one with the person with psychosis. Separate from that, we have multifamily groups, again, taken from the New York on Track program. We have the idea of multifamily groups that take place every other week and soon every week, um, where we teach both the education materials, what is going on, what needs to be done, but we also teach the behavioral skills to better interact and better communicate and better work with the person who's sick. So, for those people who are like me and have quite a bit of gray hair and not quite so much hair on the back of our heads anymore, we'll remember that, that Kim Muser long ago published a book called Behavioral Family Therapy that actually served as the basis for the behavioral family therapy part of Navigate, which is what our, uh, it's the, the techniques that we teach are based on. Um, and then finally, you're teaching social skills, but if you don't have feedback on your social skills, you're not gonna learn them. And so what we do is we have a place, we call it the clubhouse. It's not the true clubhouse model that 
like if for those of you from New York. Um, but the idea is the clubhouse is not a room, but sort of a concept. It's where we can have people socialize and also receive mentorship, health maintenance and guidance in order to learn how to socialize. And then those same so interactions can be observed and then used as the feed in to other set sessions so that people can see what needs to be corrected and what can be worked on and what works and what doesn't. And um, yeah, we, we're like everywhere else. We, we, have, we have nice furniture, we have musical instruments and we have other stuff. But the short is we give people the, a venue for pursuing um, things on their terms. Now, is music therapy or art therapy or yoga or physical fitness going to make people less psychotic? And the answer is no, it won't. But it will make them, it does demonstrably improve their buy-in to treatment in general. It enhances their belief that when they do something, there is a defined cause and effect, that they have control. The whole model for coordinated specialty care treatment is one of shared decision-making. They have to be able to participate in a way they can. If they can't do something with, write it down with words, they can do it with music. If they can't do it with music, they can do it with some crayons or magic markers or paints. But if they, they feel they're being heard, someone who feels that they're being heard and being listened to is more likely to listen to you when you're saying you need to take this medication or you need to do these homework assignments or this group therapy. So the clubhouse serves as both a social venue, but also that can be observed, similar to like maybe a peers model, but it also provides a way for people to be engaged from the very beginning. Um, I'll skip our, our thing. And finally, where are we located? We are in West LA, uh, isn't that convenient? And right near where the 405 uh, on Olympic Boulevard, right near where a couple blocks west of this hotel, right near where the 10 and the 405 cross. So it has easy access, easy places for people to go to eat. Actually in our office building, we even have a deli. So if it's not nice, we can bring food up too. The idea is to keep people engaged and getting what they need in a way that they can actually receive it and derive benefit from it. And so with that, I missed by three and a half minutes, but I will happily take questions about anything I rushed through or anything I didn't talk about at all. Pose me any question. Oh, also let me, uh, I will, I should probably stop sharing the slides, right? Or something. Can people see me? I can't remember. Yes, we can see you, Dr. Wexler. Thank okay. you so much. That was so informative. Uh, if you could stop sharing your screen and then maybe we'll go back to a gallery view so we can all kind of be together. And just, I just want to give a quick round of applause and thank you for that wonderful presentation. So thank you for sharing um, your wonderful work and offering this new uh, facility here on the West Side. Um, can we open it up for questions? Anyone in our community have questions for, for Dr. Eric Wexler? Hi, Dr. Wexler. I just had a question on the Abilify. Um, I know that's like the, well, that's the common prescription. What is, what is it that, what is it that you have found different with the ones that are possibly going to be put to market? So, um, well, there are two different drugs that are coming to market. Okay, so the one that's probably gonna make more money and is going to, because it's gonna be prescribed more, was the drug, it's gonna be called Alterant. But anyway, CEP3, the CEP3856 drug, um, the reason it is going to be different is because Abilify has two things that make people really not like it, maybe three. 
people get drowsy, people gain weight, and people and a subset of people get agitated. And despite being called a uh, atypical newer drug, whatever, the risk of tardive dyskinesia is still the same. It still runs somewhere between 0.5 and 3% a year. The the CEP 383 drug has very low level rates of somnolence, low levels of agitation, low levels of nausea, and it does not block the dopamine 2 receptor, which is the cause of tardive dyskinesia, the greatest risk for these medications long-term. It also doesn't result in the same blunting of affect that and Parkinsonian symptoms that all the other D2 blockers can. So that's why it's going to be different than Abilify. It will not replace the Abilify injectable because it's not coming out as an injection. It's going to be oral, at least initially. I have a... Oh, okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. Can you hear me? I, I, I can hear you. I can't see you because my screen's all messed okay, up. Okay, fine. Uh, Dr. Wexler, it's, it's Zeke's dad. Oh, uh, hi. For the people who are hearing about this program for the first time, sorry. Um, I just want to say that for the past 15 years, everybody's done everything they could to keep our son in check at a certain level. But since he's been in this program, it's accelerated everything about everything good that you could expect. And most importantly, he has been happy. And that is a rare quality amongst our loved ones. Thank you for that. I know the people who work here are listening and they're very glad to hear that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Wexler. Could I ask you um, about carbamazepine uh, as a substitute for lithium, if there are side effects and what the, if there are any problems? <laughs> so carbamazepine, so if, but not relevant to schizophrenia, but schizoaffective disorder for sure. Um, carbamazepine, also known as Tegretol, um, if you're taking it to reduce mania, which is probably what you're taking it for, um, in at least normal cycling bipolar patients, carbamazepine is generally not as effective as lithium. Lithium is really the gold standard. Carbamazepine is weight neutral, and therefore a lot of people like that fact. Unfortunately, its metabolism is a little complicated and it induces its own metabolism. And so the blood levels tend to change and they tend to bounce around a little bit and you have to keep taking more. It also, for that reason, it also affects a lot of other drugs like birth control. It makes less effective. It chews up other seizure medications. Um, if you happen to be Asian, you may have a gene that makes you more likely to have a very serious skin reaction when you take it. I certainly prescribe carbamazepine to people um, who have a bipolar one or schizoaffective disorder, and it works. Um, lithium probably works better. Um, there's a problem with the thyroid in lithium, so. Well, actually, so, but remember, there, if the question is, what is the good solution? Th there are none. They're all bad. And however, if you, the th thyroid dysfunction from lithium is, is completely correctable because the thyroid only makes one hormone and that one hormone gets changed into another one, but it, it still makes one hormone. It is the most correctable thing you can have as an adverse reaction. Um, whereas the numerous, there are numerous other problems with, lithium has a lot of side effects. I'm not gonna, you know, the, the greatest risk is not thyroid though. The greatest risk is people get dehydrated and become, the drug can become quickly toxic and it becomes, and it can damage the kidneys. And so it's really the, it's, it's, it's kidney function in general, water balance secondarily that really, but it's a kidney function that's the biggest difficulty with lithium. Uh, the Tegra, 
of the three non-antipsychotic drugs for treating mania, lithium, tegretol, and valproic acid. And with tegretol, I'll, I'll throw in trileptal as well, although it doesn't work as well. Um, lithium works the best and most people don't, for one reason or another, despite the fact being weight neutral, most people don't like Tegretol in the end. They come off of it and they end up choosing something else. And what is the reason for that? What, what do you look for? If my son is transitioning from lithium to that drug, what, what, what should I look for? Oh, so, so there's, right, so there's two things. There's what you can see and what you can't see. So what you can see is clumsiness or that kind of stuff. But what you can see is um, how people think and feel. And it's a qualitative thing. I honestly, I got, I got to admit, I've never taken the drug myself, but um, it has more drug interactions. So it just has more like, so for example, common thing would be on to be on Tegretol and Lamotrigine to prevent manias and depressions. You take them, but the combination of those has a very high propensity for unpleasant dizziness or clumsiness or something like that. And it's a person, my, it's not a problem if it's not a problem. So what you do is you monitor. It's not a problem if it's not a problem. I think that's the general rule for these things. But you, got, you have to check your blood levels because the blood levels are gonna change for the first six months for sure. Um, and the blood levels will change depending on what other drugs he's given. I can't obviously comment on your son specifically because I don't know who it is. And you know that you can't diagnose people who, you know. I'd, yeah. I'd like to, uh, if I may, just step in. And uh, my son has been in the program, uh, the on-track program for a little over three months. And I've got to echo what uh, Gary uh, said a few minutes ago about the program. I think it's so seems to be so well structured and very importantly, well staffed. So uh, congratulations to you, Dr. Wexler. I think you're uh, I think you've got a, a great thing going. Thank you kindly. Thank you very much. So what other information or opinions? Anybody else? If anybody's anything? Topic? Hi, doctor. Hi, it's Janice. My son, Joey, started your program. It's phenomenal. As the other parents shared, your staff is beyond incredible. Rachel, your wife, is incredible as well. My son, I learned a new term tonight from you. Can you hear me? Okay. The um, honeymoon period where my son had some life stressors beyond him, family stuff that affected his medication. And he started your program, but now he's trying to get back more balanced. He will come back. And it it is probably the most fabulous program I think I've ever seen for these young people who, and it's such a broad age, 18 to 47, 48, which is great. And they're accepting, they have a good community. And the meetings, the parent meetings were so fabulous and the amount of information. And my son, Joey has classic paranoid schizophrenia. And I just want to ask to these new meds, because he's been on clozapine for many years, will they work for him? Or is it for other so so i i'm i feel a little uncomfortable for two reasons one obviously i know your son and i've obviously known you and your son for i i think I've, yeah i mean going back to i think i was still at ucla when I, I first when i when he was first there but um no one knows so um a lot of doctors like to think we're gods. Uh, we really, you know, or maybe we talk to God. God doesn't talk back to us very often and tell us whether the medications will work, but we certainly will try them because we don't, a lot of times when you go to talks, people have a lot of molecules on the screen and they have a lot of fancy terms that you're not quite sure what they are, what they mean. And they're mostly there as smoke and mirrors and a distraction because we really don't understand 
how the brain works. We've gotten lucky in and found things, and we, we have some inkling into the hand of God, but we really don't know it yet. So the fact that two drugs working by totally different mechanisms from every other drug that's on the market, if they are just as effective, it certainly provides a lot of hope that maybe not cures, but incremental benefits. As a lot of people, anyone on this call who has uh, a loved one who's been hospitalized more than once, they're on more than one medication, most likely. And it's because one wasn't good enough. And one was added to another to get incremental benefits. But benefit is benefit. And then we have to try. We, so I'm hopeful. I'm actually one of the drugs much more than the other one. I'm very, very actually uh, looking forward to prescribing the first one. Thank you, Doc. No, you're very welcome. Can I ask a medication question that you haven't mentioned? And it, you may have, but I just didn't recognize it. I talk fast, so I probably. <laughs> yeah. My name is Juanita and I'm very new to this group. And I just want to ask a question. I don't know a lot about the medication my son is on. He's 29 years old, but it's Alonzapine. Sure. Um, also known as being, yeah. I'm sorry, what? Also known, brand name was Zyprexa, yes. Okay. Um, and I was wondering, is this something that, that is given long-term? He, um, he, he may have been caught in the honeymoon period. I'm not really sure. He's been on it for a couple months now. He was so, on one other thing before and it wasn't working. Yeah. So, well, it, the other thing may or may not have been working. The problem is it takes time. I don't have the, my slides up to like show it, but um, things don't work in days. Things take weeks to months to work. And olanzapine is a very good drug. Um, it is, for a lot of reasons, the best drug in the hospital because it's sedating, it's calming. And now the fact that it completely messes up energy metabolism such that you are eating two pound bags of M&Ms in your sleep is one of the downsides. And so, for example, um, the person who runs the schizophrenia clinic over at UCLA is Dr. Martyr. And I remember uh, at dinner once just asking, I was like, so how many people are still on olanzapine, you know, like a year out in your clinic? And he's like, as few as possible is the, is the answer. If you're going to incur the level of side effect burden that comes with olanzapine, you might as well take the clozapine. It'll be better. Um, well, I'm sorry, you might as well take what? Clozapine. Oh, okay. All right. Clozapine has the most side effects. It just happens to work the best. So okay. if you don't want the side effect burden, then um, that's why it wasn't on my list. I, I, gave a, I obviously had a very short list since there were only two drugs on it. Right. I mean, I mean it's, it's not that other drugs don't in certain circumstances um, work for individuals where other things don't, but you know, on a generalized, in a generalized sense. Some do work better. So Vralar, of the things, Vralar in this country, I mean, um, there's another drug that we have some people on, but it's really not available in the United States called, um, I mean, Soparide uh, is also quite effective. Um, it's being, trying to be brought to back to market in full doses here in the country, this country. But I think the newer drugs will, are, are going to do very well. Um, Clozapine is still the gold standard though, so we'll see. So Sharon, you've had your hand up a long time. What would you like to ask Dr. Wexler? I think you're muted. We are not hearing you. You are muted. Sharon, you're muted. You're muted. We can't hear you. I don't know why you can't hear me. I'm now we can hear you. We can hear now, you. Lean, lean toward the microphone and I think we can hear you. Okay. I wanted to know if you evaluate a person that comes in first. Um, could you, I don't. Like my daughter, my daughter is schizoaffective bipolar and she's in a hospital right now. So she probably won't be released until, I don't know, December-ish, beginning of December, something like that. And if she were to come to your program, do you evaluate beforehand to, to see what she's uh, so well that depends well first off i'm 
there are a couple possible questions you're asking. One is, do I evaluate every individual who is going to call on the phone and potentially come in? I don't evaluate everyone before they show up personally. Um, I don't mean before. I mean, if she came in, do you sit the person down and evaluate them? So I will, for the time being, I'm going, for the time being, I am, we'll talk to everyone when they show up within 48 hour, 48 hours. The evaluation of whether they're appropriate though, is usually you can do, is done ahead of time. Um, because we have a pretty broad, we take people who other places don't. So we have, if they're standing up in groups or walking out or doing stuff, so long as they're not violent, I really our only criteria for not taking people not taking any sex offenders and I'm not taking anyone who's gonna be violent. But other than that, simply not thinking clearly and behaving right, well, that's part of the illness. So we kind of, we got a pretty broad, broad reach. So, but we'll talk to whoever is referring them over. And obviously some places will be easier. If, you know, if someone calls, if one of the social workers from UCLA calls, I, I, we know them, we trust them, right? I'm not going to say which hospitals, but some of the other hospitals, you've got to be more careful. And but the clinical presentation tells you. Will will you have groups? Will they be in like group settings? I think I'm I'm sorry, maybe I, I don't I guess I'm I'm a little baffled by the question. So if they came, so this is a program of group therapy and groups and some individual, but Groups, that is what the program is. So if, oh, okay. if they're coming to that groups, they're coming to groups. Um, but how about this? Send me an email and any questions you want and I'll, and I'll, uh, okay. I'll, I'll respond. Uh, send it to, um, send to my secretary. Send it to Wexler secretary. Actually, you want to put it in the chat? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll give you just my secretary's email. Um, let me think of a uh, here. Only for tonight. I mean, I got to set up a different email address, but just for tonight here, so so you don't feel like you're being left out here. Um, uh, um, you know what? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you, I'll give you my direct email here. I'm, a, I'm such a bad typist. I'm always afraid I, I typed it wrong. You put it in the chat. Is that what you did? Yeah. You put it in the chat for everybody. So everybody look in the chat if you yeah. want Dr. Wexler's email. Okay. Yeah. I mean, because maybe there's some, you know, if there's like, I'm sure I can answer anything you got. I mean, I, I may just be. So, so thank you. We'll look in the chat. Sanji, did you want to ask a question? And then Josh, did you want to ask a question after that? Sanji? Yeah. Sure. Sure. So Dr. Wexler to Terry. Okay, yeah. So Sanjeet, I'll answer you and then I'll answer Terry's question. Thanks for your presentation, uh, Dr. Wexler. Uh, appreciated hearing it all. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, neurocognitive deficits, uh, some of the neurotoxicity of the episodes and the cognitive remediation. Uh, the reason I wanted to ask you is because, so after I went through my first of three episodes, you know, I had noticed that school had gotten tremendously harder. Of course. Uh, I yes. was a full-time student, academically always achieved, you know, really highly. And then I became a part-time student who had to put much, much more work into being able to uh, move forward with my, with my academics, but extremely slowly now. So I got a neuropsych evaluation back after the last hospitalization in 96. And the big deficit for me was uh, working memory. Uh, at that time, when I got the test, it was in 
uh, the bottom 1% of the population. Fortunately, my executive functioning was fairly fairly well, so it kind of can mask things. But I, I notice it, you know, on a daily basis. You know, so I watched Dr. I think his name was Greenberg. He presented once. He's a neuropsychologist uh, at UCLA. You and, give me, give me Michael Green. Uh, Green. Yeah, Michael. yeah. And he, yeah. he, I guess, developed a lot of the um, like airless learning, you know, cognitive mediation type of stuff, trying to access different memory systems outside of working memory to help people with that deficit. And I learned that about more than not, about ninety percent of people who have schizophrenia or schizoaffective depressive type actually have that deficit in the bottom 1%. And so I'm wondering like, okay, for me, I took the medications, you know, now, and going through the horrible episodes is bad enough, you know, but now you have these deficits, you know, that are more long-term and that are not treated with medication that don't allow you just to jump out back into the life that you had before, you know? Sure, sure. And it's sure. a much, much slower process of recovery. And, you know, it takes a lot more support, which fortunately I got. And over a course of 16 years, you know, I was able to get my uh, MSW, but I know about the cognitive remediation software. And I had talked a little bit to Dr. Le the late Dr. Lieberman, and he had talked about that not only do you have to like do that sort of training, but also in some way it has to be integrated into your daily life moving forward to maintain any sort so of. The, so you've obviously ascended, you've obviously been through a tremendous amount. You deserve a lot of credit for being able to really fight your way through and fight your way back. And I think that it's, you know, an example for everyone and you deserve a lot of credit. The, and you bring up a good point. And uh, I don't remember Dr. Liberman saying that before, but it's true. And so part of what we do is the, the software that's used over UCLA, actually the, the, the general concepts actually weren't developed. Michael Green is a, does cognition, but especially social cognition. The, the cognitive remediation programs that are used at UCLA, the basis of those were actually developed by a woman, Alice Medallia over in New York. Um, but part of them isn't just playing on the computer. Yes, you have to apply them. And sometimes you have uh, probably verbal, whether it's verbal or nonverbal working memory, you probably had some also some decreased processing speed. And there's a few other things on the, on the battery, but use it, use it more and at some point it can get better. I mean, the, the same principles are applied to people with first breaks or, or schizophrenic breaks as people with brain injuries. The same techniques of repetition and compensation. So you, you remediate what you can, do all the exercises you can and keep doing them every day and apply them in as many different venues as possible. And those things which you just can't get better, you figure a way to work around because the existing cognitive structure can very often, some of the other pathways can be utilized. Um, to, so think of things in a different way. And the compensation, you know, the simplest thing is obviously making lists, but it's a lot more, more than that. And so that's where like we introduced the cog compensatory cognitive training, which is, has been trialed for schizophrenia, but was originally developed for traumatic brain injury at the VA. Um, and so, okay, so there's also a Terry Schiffer, had a question about does clozapine cause sedation and weight gain? Heck yeah. Um, and like a lansipine, yes, sedation and weight gain are among the two most unpleasant side effects of being on clozapine. Um, also, my nephew takes injectables. Okay, I'll just read the question. Dr. Wexler, does clozapine cause sedation and weight gain? My father is 70 with paranoid schizophrenia, taking Zyprexa 10 milligrams daily. He has ballooned in weight. My nephew takes injectable Abilify and ballooned as well. Some diagnosis, my sisters and I are concerned about their cardiovascular health. Very reasonable concern. So antipsychotic medications in general, and clozapine especially, lead to weight gain. 
they lead to elevated triglycerides, elevated cholesterol, um, hypertension, and even absent the weight gain, they do those things to some degree, but they can be mitigated by weight loss. Um, the drugs that are more weight neutral are, would be Latuda or Vralar. Obviously that's for your doctors to figure out. Um, but a lot of them do cause significant weight gain. Um, the good news is that they're all addressable by diet. It's just, you know, it's hard to diet. I mean, we are in America, diets are hard. But if you do diet, if you keep the calories fixed, you won't gain weight. Could I add something to that? So Dr. Wexler, my son, Joey, when he was first on clozapine, he gained 67 pounds and he's tall and thin. He's almost 6'2". And I was so upset. I fought with Dr. Sajay for two years. I said, I don't, I didn't want him to take clozapine. So we tried every other drug. Nothing worked except the old standard, the Rolls Royce for paranoid schizophrenia, uh, clozapine. So then when he went back to a program in New Jersey called Earth House, they taught Joey, no sugar, no dairy, uh, no red meat. He walked about an hour a day out in the forest, whatnot. And he was out in nature. And I have to say, he's been on clozapine the last few years and he's so thin and he really recognizes that he can't eat sugar. He can't have too much dairy, red meat. And I see he is cognizant about his, what he puts in his mouth, which he wasn't aware of until he learned about the, the right diet. And it really makes a difference. And he is on back on clozapine and I'm just thrilled because I never would have believed it. Now, health maintenance. Let's, let's just call on Josh, who's had his hand up a long time here. Josh, did you want to say something? Yeah, no, I just had a question on these new drugs, Dr. Wexler. Yeah. You know, one of the things we keep reading is that the drugs are good for negative symptoms and less effective or p positive symptoms, but much less effective for negative symptoms, which in fact are the kinds of symptoms that lead to you know, longer term deficits in people's sure. actual lives. I was just wondering if any of these new drugs show particular promise on the negative symptom side. Okay. So, so, right. So there are three, I said two drugs. There's a third drug that was being developed specifically for negative symptoms, but the trials have been, um, they failed on the negative symptoms. The, the, the CEP383 drug and the Corona uh, XT drug, both show um, a three to four point. Okay, I don't wanna get like too into like technical jargon. Both of them, both of them have, seem to have benefits for negative symptoms. Okay. Sounds pretty modest though. Put the name out for us. That 383, what is it? Can you say it again? Oh, CEP383856, if I got the numbers correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, well, it's true, and the and the and the muscarinic drug, the Corona drug, had a change of. Uh, it was also, I think, it was a four point on the martyr scale. Um, it's better than better than what we got. I mean, I mean that's. I mean that's. I mean, really, what it comes down to is. Um, and the only way to know, because I mean, there it was the original. It's like two original trials, so we'll see how things do um, going forward. Um, they do something. They they do more than risperidone does. I mean, it's it's, but they're not on the market, so the numbers are limited to the sample size in the clinical trials, mm -hmm. and they're being primarily developed in the United States. So it's not like a drug that's already available overseas or something. Um, uh, so that you can go by. Okay, thanks. So any, after we'll talk about it further. Any other questions from anybody that we haven't called on for Dr. Wexler? Any other questions this evening? Uh, yes, um, I had a question. I was wondering, is there any research dedicated at all to anisognosia? Um, either just kind of under, understanding the root causes of it or either from a pharmacological... Oh. 
that is an that is a very interesting yes there are yes there are from time to time you'll see papers on okay so for people who don't who people are weren't aware so anos agnosia is the not knowing about what's wrong with you and as and as anos agnosia is not specific to schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or depression or traumatic brain injury but is um present in a lot of types of neurocognitive problems. Um, yes, there is a literature. Most of the literature on anosognosia actually is from the stroke literature and less to a lesser degree from traumatic brain injury. More than that, I can, if you send me, I can point you to some stuff. I will tell you that if you want to dive into that, it's going to it's going to be a little messy. It's it's pretty technical. Well, you are so knowledgeable, Dr. Wexler. You have answered every question with a great amount of detail and uh, explanations, and we all appreciate your California on track more than you can ever imagine. I think you will have no trouble uh, finding many candidates to participate in California on track. Well, we thank you. Thank you, Sharon. I'm delighted to have you here this evening. We are grateful you're doing this. And it's another avenue for turning psychosis into a pathway of recovery. So um, we're very grateful that you're Thank you for, you know, having this Thank in you West for. LA, right near where all of us live. And uh, we're just so grateful. Thank you for having me. And I will let my last word will be is to just let everyone know that. Recovery is possible. You just have to go about it the right way. Yes. So, so you all, you all got his phone number and his email if you want to contact. Did everyone get that? It's in the chat. Uh, did we put your phone number in the chat, Dr. Wexler? Uh, I can. Here, I will. Can you put your phone number in the chat, please? Yeah, I will. Here, I'm um, typing. I'm so Thank happy. you, Dr. Wexler. And I know there's been some uh, requests and uh, asks about where this presentation will be seen or where you can view it again or share it uh, with other community members that weren't uh, able to meet with us this evening. And it will be on our YouTube channel within the week. So um, you can find it there and you can share it with your community members. Okay. So this I'm, is my number at OnTrack. This is the OnTrack number. So you can... It's it's in, it's in the chat four two four, four one six, four one six, seven eight nine two. So we thank you so much. You have illuminated and given hope to all of our family members who have these brain diagnoses. So we feel very grateful, and I have a dog crying in the background that you might hear that I can't stop. Who wants a snack, a late night snack? No. <laughs> so thank you. So I want to tell you about our holiday speaker. We are having someone from DD Hirsch come. DD Hirsch is one of the largest mental health treatment uh, centers uh, in Glendale and West LA here down actually in Culver City, and they will be presenting and explaining what they do and what they offer the community. And uh, also Dr. Ken Duckworth is coming to LA in December. Dr. G Ken Duckworth has had a very uh, preeminent role in NAMI National, and he has written a very excellent book called You Are Not Alone. I'm just reading it. It is really uh, excellent. I recommend you all get it. And if there's any way we can get all of our NAMI Westside people to listen to him, I think he's spe speaking with NAMI uh, Los Angeles County rather than our affiliate. But if we can get you all invited to that, we will definitely send out that information for you. And I want to thank our beautiful executive director, Aaron Raftery, who leads NAMI and works on so many different levels all the time for us. She's amazing. And I want to thank Janice Blackwater. We have the speaker meeting because of her. We is funded because of her. And she is a very uh, uh, 
great mental health advocate for NAMI West Side LA. We're very appreciative of you, Janice, and we always will be. So thanks all of you. And we look forward to seeing you in December, the first week of every month, we have a speakers meeting. So this meeting with Dr. Wexler will be recorded. It's on our website, www.namila.org. So just go on our website and all the previous speakers have been recorded too that you can listen to. We've had some amazing speakers through the years. So thank you again. And I hope you have a pleasant Thanksgiving and stay well and stay safe. And we'll see you in December. Stay safe, everyone. Right. Thank you again. Thank you, Be well, everyone. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Wexler. Okay.